I'm Bill McWilliam, president of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com or phone us at 604-924-5504. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Jordan Bateman, Communications Director for the Independent Contractors and Business Association. Welcome back to the show, Jordan. Thanks for having me, Jim. The B.C. government has asked the Utilities Commission to review the Site C construction project how is this being received by your association well we're gravely concerned uh with this move um we think it's unnecessarily putting 2400 jobs in jeopardy on the construction side and really uh you know kind of damaging a um a much needed project uh for bc's future so we're very worried about it and you know there's there's just a mountain of flaws in in this plan to uh, to send it to, uh, for review. What do you fear is going to happen, and what will the fallout be? Well, first of all, we should be clear. Look, the opponents of this dam, it does not matter how many reviews you send it to. Um, it will not matter how much paper is generated about it, how many studies there are. The opponents of this dam will oppose it forever. There's just no way of winning them over. So, you know, this idea that, oh, you know, the only problem with the process was it didn't go to the BC Utilities Commission, and once they take a look, uh, you know, if they say it's okay, everyone will be on board. You and I both know that in this province of, you know, NIMBYs and anti-everything uh, uh, activists, uh, that that's just nonsense. Uh, you know, the, the interesting thing the NDP did yesterday was they exempted certain things from being looked at by the UC. So, for example, they won't look at any of the environmental uh, aspects, regulations around it. Um, to kind of put that in the context, you know, BC Hydro's application on the environmental side was 29,000 pages worth of studies. That's a stack of paper higher than an NBA basketball hoop. And uh, I was actually, I, I, we were in Victoria yesterday doing an event. We talked to Vaughn Palmer and pointed out that, you know, a newspaper columnist could write 700 words a day, you know, every weekday. Uh, it would take 56 years to match the length of that uh, environmental assessment. So this thing was study to, to death at that point, received the approvals, 150 different uh, binding conditions, um, that part went on. It also doesn't address, uh, the, the UC is also not going to look into the um, agricultural impact. Uh, there's been a lot of false facts spread by um, opponents of the dam as to, you know, how uh, terrible this will be for agriculture. They, in fact, you know, only about two-tenths of one percent of BC's farmland is impacted by this dam. And, in fact, there will be uh, uh, quite a bit of money. I think it's $150 million spent on improving agriculture nearby. So, uh, you know, it's basically a wash when it comes to agriculture. But, again, it's not being looked at by the BCUC, and uh, and so that will be a problem. What, what this all means is they're going to look at the financial implications. Um, you know, we think that this project's, you know, gone far enough down the road that you've got to complete it. Uh, you, you know, we need something at the end of this uh, to make the you know, probably $5.5 billion or so that we've spent, committed, and we need to remediate the site. You've got to get something for that money. Well, yes, you reach a certain point where if you pull the plug, the penalties you have to pay for torn up contracts exceeds the value of the project. That's precisely right. So $2 billion has already been spent, uh, according to Hydra. There's another $2 billion that have been put out in contracts. You know, Andrew Weaver says, oh, you know, that shouldn't count as spending. Uh, you know, as if Andrew Weaver, uh, you know, as if uh, Hydro doesn't have penalties uh, for breaking those contracts. Of course they do. Um, and then, you know, most people estimate it to be about a billion and a half dollars in order to put the site back to how it was. Um, you know, this project's 20% complete already. Uh, you know, they're working every day. 2,400 people are working on it uh, today. We're actually spending, you know, about $2 million a day building this thing. Um, you know, we're in this. We're in this now. The decision was made, um, and now we've got to see it through. If this project's canned, are you worried other projects will be put down the toilet as well? Yeah, absolutely. This is kind of the bigger picture. And 
this is one of the reasons why I think some of these eco-activists are fighting this thing so bad. I mean, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense for environmentalists to fight the Site C Dam when it's going to produce clean energy and help Canada meet its climate commitments under the Paris Accord. But they're doing it anyways, and, and this is why. Um, they want to kill... They want to kill every major project in Canada that has to do with energy. They want to kill every oil and gas project and leave the oil and gas that's in Canada in the ground. That is their number one goal. So they will pervert everything else to get to that goal. So what happens is, you know, on Site C, you know, they don't want Site C in case some of that power gets used for fracking or, you know, to, for LNG or something like that. So they want to fight it based on that. They also want to fight it because they want to send a message to the investment community worldwide that Canada is not a good place to do business, that even the government can't get its own projects through, and that even if you do manage to go through all the process, get all your environmental permits, um, we haven't even talked about, you know, 14 times Site C has been taken to court, 14 times the court has upheld BC Hydro and, and Site C. Uh, you know, even if you do all of that work, a government down a whim can uh, take away everything and, and, and ruin it for you. So... You know, to, the, to them, that's a great message to send to the international energy community because, you know, it'll prevent uh, oil and gas companies from coming and investing here and uh, turning our resources into jobs and economic activity for British Columbia. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after the break. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. A work program is planned for our Finland property that contains diamond-bearing kimberlite. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ADD, and the Frankfurt Exchange, symbol 82A1. Please visit our website at arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. Lotus Ventures Inc. is a BC-based medical marijuana company poised to launch into the rapidly evolving cannabis sector. Lotus is in the final review stage of the Health Canada approvals to become a licensed producer, having arranged facility financing of up to $12 million, plus building permits for its prototype indoor production facility. Shares trade under the symbol J on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Visit our website at lotusventures.ca. Welcome back. We're chatting with Jordan Bateman. Jordan, talk about sending messages. Uh, Petronas canceled their giant LNG project in BC, another project that would have created thousands of jobs and been a long-term source of revenue for the province. Was this a case of the price of natural gas makes it not worth it, or is it also fear that a a green NDP government may not be friendly to a resource-based business? Uh, look, there was a lot of uh, uh, there was a lot of straw on that proverbial camel's back. Um, there were a lot of uh, big issues with the project, uh, but there's no doubt the you know NDP Green Coalition and their very nasty comments about Petronas in the past. There's no doubt that that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, you know, this is a crushing blow for the BC economy. This was a 36 uh, billion dollar project. To put that into context, the entire BC budget. Uh, for healthcare, education, everything included, is only $45 billion. This was $36 billion of private money. This wasn't like, you know, we're being taxed to build it or like with the Site C Dam, you know, we're rate payers and we, you know, we'll pay for some of it through our, our rates going, um, through our rates going forward. This was private money and there's just no replacing that. Uh, you know, <laughs> there aren't any other companies out there with tens of billions of dollars looking to spend them in, in British Columbia. So, you know, it's it's a crippling blow. You start to put it into context, right? Like thirty-six billion dollars worth of private investment. Um, you know, the the whole TransLink plan of uh, you know the new Patello, the uh, uh, the Broadway subway, and and the Surrey Light Rail system. You know, all that together is about eight billion. So you know, it's <laughs> it's four and a half times that as far as you know investment in infrastructure goes. It's it's uh, four Site C dams in terms of infrastructure. And again, it's all private money. This was like found money for British Columbians, money coming into our province, investing in us, creating new supply chains. Uh, forget even the direct jobs, thousands and thousands of indirect jobs and spinoff. And, uh, you know, we let it slip through our fingers. Carol Taylor told me when she was finance minister, she had nightmares about the price of natural gas because she said a one cent change meant the difference in tens of millions of dollars for the province. 
how much will the province lose in natural gas royalties because we don't have LNG? Well, it, it takes away one more customer, right? It takes away one more avenue to to get that gas out of British Columbia. It's it's troublesome. You know, it's a good point. You know, before the recession in 08, uh, the BC Liberals were racking up large surpluses uh, under Carol Taylor as finance minister. And a lot of that was powered by um, an increase in uh, the price of natural gas. And, you know, you, you look uh, east to Alberta, and maybe it gets a lot more coverage in Alberta than it does here, but, you know, oil is their key, right? Like, when oil prices are down, <clears throat> they're in trouble. When oil prices are up, their budget looks pretty good, and they can overspend and do overspend on a number of things. Um, natural gas is a huge contributor to BC's economy. It would have been another one of those kind of stabilizing positive economic forces that we could have had going forward. Um, but instead, like I said, it, it kind of slipped through our fingers. Uh, you know, <laughs> NFL training camps are underway right now. Uh, the biggest fumble of the year, though, has already happened. It's, uh, it's BC fumbling LNG. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after this. I'm Brian Fowler, president of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted, historic engineer gold mine in the Atlan District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. In Goddard, we trust. Welcome back. We're speaking with Jordan Bateman. Jordan, the NAFTA talks are about to get underway. Is it a positive sign the Canadian government includes on our committee looking after NAFTA people like Rana Ambrose, the interim leader of the Conservatives, and their former industry minister, James Moore? It's not just a, a one-sided committee. It's one that takes a look at different sides. NDP and and the Canadian Federation of Labour apparently also have people there. Yeah, I think it's just one of these issues. And, you know, there aren't many in Canada that are this big, um, but it transcends all political boundaries, right? You need to make sure that as many people as possible are scrutinizing this thing from different perspectives to understand what the ramifications are for various industries and, and, and various groups. So, yeah, you know, um, We've been very critical of Trudeau in the past. There's been lots of things he's done that's, you know, kind of driven me crazy as a fiscal conservative. But, uh, you know, kudos to them for trying to put together as broad a committee as possible. Uh, hopefully they actually listen to the advice they get from that committee. Um, and, you know, the, the, the devil will be in the details. I mean, in any negotiation, there's horse trading and certain industries may be hurt uh, so that other industries may benefit. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how they balance all of those uh, very disparate needs. It's been pointed out the current NAFTA document is 3,600 pages. If it was truly free trade, shouldn't the document be one page long saying, if you make it, we'll buy it if it's a decent price? <laughs> I guess that would be the freest of free trade, but uh, you and I have been around enough politicians to know that, you know, there's lots of groups that they have to pl placate and, uh, you know, they want to uh, to please. So, you know, I, I have no idea how this thing's going to go because, you know, you have someone in the White House who uh, is the ultimate decision maker on a lot of this stuff, and he's not predictable. So it'll be very intriguing to see the American stance on it, you know, just how much rope the negotiators have, and just how clear Trump is in his uh, marching orders to them. I think that will probably be the most important, uh, 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 the most important step towards success or failure. His Trumpness today said the U.S. doesn't have to worry about Canada on trade. Is that a positive note? Yeah, look, if he wants to uh, deal with Mexico, if he's focused on Mexico, <laughs> thank goodness, that's probably better for us. So uh, bad for our friends in Mexico, but at the same time, um, you know, uh, we don't want to – the less he can be on his radar, I think, the better. I actually, I actually picture I actually picture Trump as a, kind of like a cartoon character. And Remember when you would watch a cartoon, they'd have one of those, like, black bombs and the fuse would be ticking down? Picture Trump holding that bomb, and your job as Prime Minister Trudeau is to keep him pointed away from you at all times. So uh, I think that should be the strategy in dealing with Donald Trump. Well, I remember hearing for, from a, a famous Canadian politician, it's very important for the U.S. not to pay attention to Canada because look what's happened to countries it has paid attention to, the best example perhaps being Iraq. Yeah, well, exactly. And it, you know, it's a weird thing with Trump in that 
<clears throat> he seems more critical of his allies and, and his friends than he does of his enemies, right? You, know, you think of how hard he's worked to try to build a relationship with Beijing and, and with Moscow. Meanwhile, you know, he's taking swipes at Germany. You know, he lambasted, didn't he hang up on the Australian prime minister? Um, yeah, you know, a little bit concerning to see him so, uh, um, so harsh with his allies and, and so easy with his enemies. And also I've heard from people on, in the financial markets that they don't trade on information out of the White House because it's unreliable. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It's, um, it's a leak fest over there, and uh, it's hard to know what's true. And this is part of the problem with the, for the media is that you know, they're, they're running with stories based on a leak, and sometimes they pan out and sometimes they don't. Um, and that, I think, withers the trust uh, because there's, you know, for people who support Trump, there's always a, a fake news story for them to point to, uh, you know, based on maybe some shoddier or too quick reporting. Jordan, what kind of noises are you hearing out of out of Victoria right now about their policies? They're reviewing their housing policy. Maybe they'll rescind the foreign buyers tax because that was basically based on a myth. Yeah, there there's a lot going on in Victoria. They're reviewing everything. I think part of it is they're trying to weigh like when you're in opposition, it's easy to to kick the stuffing out of a government and all their policies. But you come in and all of a sudden you're fettered by a lot of things that the previous group was fettered by. And, you know, David Eby, let's take David Eby. When have we known David Eby to ever back down from a fight? Never. Like, you know, those of us who followed his career when he was with Civil Liberties and Pivot, uh, all the way through his, uh, his work on the housing file as a critic, this is a guy who jumped into every fight. Well, now all of a sudden he's Attorney General, and if you, know, if you follow his language a little bit, he's kind of softening on the Kinder Morgan thing, right? You know, we can't hold up permits. You know, we don't have as many tools in the toolkit as maybe we thought. Um, that's a big shift, and, and and that is the that's what happens when you get into government, right? In opposition, you can say whatever you want because you're unfettered, but in government, you actually do have to you know obey the rule of law. You have to make sure you're not exposing taxpayers to uh, you know massive lawsuits. Um, you know, I think they're uh, I think they're trying to find their feet. Well, also too, you kind of have to follow up the promises of the previous government because they had their conditions, and Kinder Morgan met those as well as long or I should say, along with the ones imposed by the federal government, which, at the end of the day, can always impose legislation forcing B.C. to do whatever it wants. Yeah, exactly. And ultimately, the Trudeau government holds the hammer. And, you know, amazingly, Trudeau's government supports this thing after basically running against it. Um, yeah, there, there are not a lot of options here, and it probably will come down to, I think the last option they maybe have is, you know, teaming up with some of these First Nations and trying to hold it up there. Um, but at the same time, the courts have started to kind of swing the pendulum back on First Nations. And if you can prove that you've met with them many times and tried your very, very best to, to build consensus, um, that's usually enough for the courts now. It's not necessary to have their express permission. Um, so it's, it's an interesting thing to see what will happen. And, uh, you know, Kinder Morgan, Kinder Morgan and Site C are only related in this way. I, I do feel like the Greens and the eco activists, the, the George Heyman wing of the NDP, I do feel like they are desperate to have a pelt on the wall. They want a trophy from this NDP government, something they can point to and say, "We killed this." And you know, it's becoming clearer and clearer. It's not going to be Kinder Morgan, and that's one of the things that has us more and more worried for Site C. Jordan, thank you so much for chatting with us. Hey, thanks for having me, Jim. My guest has been Jordan Bateman, Communications Director for the Independent Contractors and Business Association. Their website, icba.ca. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.